when we state Newton's second law in the form sum of all forces equals the product of mass and acceleration, and take note this is a vector equation, it's only the external forces that are acting on an object or a system that um, factor into the amount of acceleration. So here's a, a video lesson to help illustrate the differences between internal and external forces. And we'll just do a few problems, starting with one that describes three blocks that are pulled by a constant applied force F across a smooth frictionless desk. So the blocks are all um, described in terms of these masses. Block A has a mass of 12 kilograms. Block B has a mass of 3 kilograms. And block C has a mass of 5 kilograms. And we're asked to find the tension in the rope segment connecting blocks B and C. So how much tension is in that segment? OK. Um, the one thing that was missing in this problem is what the amount of applied force, um, the value, let's say, is um, well, how about 100 newtons? So if the force, we could picture it, we'll color in the strings. Maybe the rope you're directly pulling on is this purple rope, and the tension in that segment is 100. We're trying to find the tension in the red rope segment. There's no guarantee that those two have the same tension. In fact, it's almost certain they aren't. And there's a third separate strand of rope that connects the 3 kilogram and 12 kilogram. OK, so find the tension in that red rope if the tension in the purple rope is 100 newtons. So one way to go about this is to imagine containing all three blocks together as if they were a single object. Now, if that were the case, then we'd have a system whose total mass would be equal to 20 kilograms if we add it all up, right? Because the red rope and the orange rope are within that system, the tensions in those two segments of string would be internal force. And they wouldn't factor at all into the amount of acceleration that all 20 kilograms um, have in common. And of course, the whole system accelerates to the right with one common value of acceleration. Um, unless these ropes are made out of bungee cord or something that could stretch so you could have a change in distance between these. But if these are tight ropes, then whatever the acceleration of block C is also the acceleration of block B and block A. They all move together as one common system. Right, so if I'm picturing this as a 20 kilogram system, then the only external force is the 100 newtons. So this would be very easy to find what is the acceleration of the whole system. So the accel we could say something like this. The acceleration, for example, of block B would be equal to the sum of all external forces that act on block B divided by the mass of block B. Totally valid expression. It's also valid to say the acceleration of the whole system is the net external force acting on the whole system divided by the mass, you guessed it, of the whole system. So as long as we don't do any mixing and matching of um, subscripts, then the equation holds. Well, let's consider what forces would be external to just block B. OK, let's highlight that block. The forces that are external to block B, well, there's, I guess, four of them. But we know two of them are going to have a canceling effect. Here's the two that are going to cancel. The normal force pushing up from the ground on block B is almost certainly going to be canceled by the weight of block B, OK? So if those two cancel each other out, we can neglect them from the get-go. And we're only interested in the forces that lie along the x-axis. So what forces are external to block B along the x-axis? Well, you might think this 100 Newton force is. However, not exactly, because that 100 Newton force, that tension, in no way directly attaches or is applied to block B. The 100 Newton force would be external to block C or external to the whole system. 
uh, but it's not a force that's uh, acting directly on block B. The two external forces along the x-axis acting on block B is the tension in the red string pulling to the right and the amount of tension in the orange string pulling to the left. We don't know either of those tensions, so we're not going to get very far by making a free body diagram for block B. Our best first step is to find the acceleration of the whole system. And like we said, now forces that were external to block B happen to be internal to the system. The tension in the orange rope, the tension in the red rope are not external to the system. So when we apply this equation, we find the acceleration of the system is equal to 100 newtons divided by a mass of 20 kilograms. And so we get the whole system accelerates at 5 meters per second squared. Now, if we want to find the tension in the red rope, we could make a free body diagram. How about a free body diagram exclusively for block C? Let me draw our system one more time. Twelve kilogram, three kilogram, five kilogram. And now we know the whole system accelerates to the right at five meters per second squared. And we're still trying to find the tension in this segment. So how about we make a free body diagram not for the whole system, but for block C. Okay. So that dot represents five kilograms of mass. Probably don't really need to draw the normal force and the weight. I know they're going to cancel out. What I'm really interested in are the forces along the x-axis. So you already know that there's a force of 100 newtons pulling to the right. And we're trying to find this tension that pulls back to the left. Now notice I drew the length of the tension vector that connects blocks B and C. Maybe that's what we'll call this tension BC. And we'll just call this T prime, maybe. Anyway, I drew the tension between blocks B and C as a shorter vector than T prime. Because after all, I know it accelerates to the right. So I know there has to be a net force that points to the right. Okay? So uh, conceptualizing and thinking about the relative lengths of your vectors is part of the benefit and the exercise of making free body diagrams. So it looks like when we have a free body diagram in which normal force and gravity have canceled each other out, then it's pretty easy to see that the net force is equal to T prime minus TBC. Net force is also mass times acceleration. Now remember what mass this uh, referred to. This free body diagram is just for a mass of 5 kilograms. That's why this tension we're solving for appeared as an external force when it would have otherwise not appeared because it would have been internal had we made a free body diagram for the whole entire system. Okay, so uh, mass times acceleration is T prime minus TBC. So the quantity we're solving for, TBC, is equal to T prime minus mass times acceleration. And so in this case, the tension connecting blocks B and C is equal to 100 newtons minus 5 kilograms times 5 meters per second squared. In other words, 100 newtons minus 25 newtons, and so we get an answer of 75 newtons. I want to point out how we can check to see if our answer is correct. So notice what we would have found had we made a free body diagram for the compound system made up of just blocks A and B. Let's make that free body diagram. Let's say this dot represents, what would that be, 15 kilograms, correct? 12 kilograms plus 3 kilograms. Now, I could say normal force and mg cancel out, 
but you know how that works. So we really only need to draw the forces that are external to the compound body made up of blocks A and B um, along the x-axis. Well, for that compound body, the tension between the two is an internal force, but the tensions between blocks B and C is external. And this force, T prime, of 100 newtons is not applied to that compound body at all. So the only force acting on the combination of blocks A and B that directly um, applies and is external is the tension between blocks B and C. But we already found that that's 75 newtons. So the acceleration should simply be 75 newtons divided by 15 kilograms, the combined mass of those two blocks. And of course, that gives us the 5 meters per second squared that we already found earlier. If we made a free body diagram just for block B, what would we have? This is now a 3 kilogram object. Normal force and mg cancel out. Now there is a force external to block B. That's the tension between B and C pulling to the right. And this piece of string is also external to block B. So there's tension pulling back to the left. OK, so we have tension B, C pulling to the right. And we know already that's 75 newtons. And then there's some tension AB pulling to the left. And we don't know its value. This is all referring to a 3 kilogram block. So we can now find how much tension this happens to be, right? We would say that the net force along the x-axis is equal to 75 newtons minus TAB. But that net force should be mass times acceleration. So here it's a mass of 3 kilograms accelerating at 5 meters per second squared. It gives us 15 newtons. So 15 newtons equals 75 newtons minus TAB. So that means TAB would be equal to um, 60 newtons if you do the math. Now as a last uh, point of emphasis, what if we made a free body diagram just for block A? Now the forces external to that block are normal force and weight. Those cancel. And then the tension connecting blocks A and B is the only external force pulling it to the right. But we just found that that's 60 newtons. And when 60 newtons is applied to 12 kilograms, we get an acceleration of, you guessed it, 5 meters per second squared. So no matter whether we make a free body diagram for each of the individual blocks, or we make a free body diagram for any combination of blocks to form a sort of system, we find that the acceleration of every object works out to be the same. And as long as we don't mix and match subscripts, we can apply Newton's second law rather universally. Here's another problem along the same lines. This time we have two blocks, and we're going to apply a force F from the left side. And there happens to be an egg that's sandwiched in between the two blocks. Now, I want you to do a gut check. In which case do you think it's more likely that the egg is going to break? Now, by the way, um, this is a smooth surface, so think of it like a uh, really highly waxed tile floor or something like this. We're going to say it's um, frictionless. I suppose there's no such thing as a perfectly frictionless surface, but like an air hockey table comes close, or maybe an um, uh, ice hockey rink or something like this. So you can imagine something that's so close to frictionless that it, uh, we could treat it as such. So if you come along and apply a force, everything wants to accelerate together. But in which case would the egg be more likely to break? You say case A or case B. Why don't you make your guess and scribble it down just to get a feel of whether or not your instinct for physics is, uh, 
is on point. So let's read this problem carefully. An egg is stuck between two blocks. The smaller block has a mass of 2 kilograms. Let's fill that in. That's going to be the same in both case A and B. And the larger block has a mass of 6 kilograms. We'll fill that in too. Okay. The force applied to the pair of blocks is the same in both cases A and B and equal to 12 newtons. All right. In which case is the egg more likely to break? I think what we're really trying to figure out is um, what's the internal force of contact between the two blocks in each case? So if we treat the 2 kilogram and 6 kilogram blocks together as a system, the force that crushes the egg is an internal force. However, if we make a free body diagram just for either the 2 kilogram block by itself or the 6 kilogram block, then that force of contact between the two of them is no longer internal and can be treated as external. So let's do something similar to what we did in the previous problem. Let's just find what the acceleration of the whole system is. So we'll solve for case A first. The acceleration of the system is the net external force acting on the whole system divided by the mass of the whole system. OK, well, yeah, there's a force of contact between the two blocks, but that's internal to the system. So the only external force is the 12 newtons. And once again, I'm disregarding the normal force and the weight because they're going to cancel each other out. So right, this 12 newtons is the only force, and the contact between the two blocks is internal. So we find the acceleration of the system is equal to 12 newtons divided by 8 kilograms, right, the mass of the whole system. So this gives us an acceleration of 1.5 meters per second squared. Now in order to determine that contact force, let's try something. Let's make a free body diagram for just the 2 kilogram object. Normal force and weight cancel out. Now what's external to the 2 kilograms? Well, that 12 newton force is applied directly to the 2 kilogram object and pointing to the right. But then there's also this 6 kilogram block pushing back to the left against the 2 kilograms. That's the normal force. That's the force of contact. So we'll call this N subscript G, the normal force of the ground, and then we'll call this N, um, well, we'll just call it N. That's good enough, right? So there's a contact between the system and the ground, and there's a contact between the two blocks themselves. Normal force from the ground, normal force between the two blocks. Okay, this is the force that crushes the egg. That's what we're trying to solve for. I know that the 2 kilograms accelerates at 1.5 meters per second squared, as does the 6 kilograms, as does the whole system. So knowing that the normal force from the ground and mg have canceled each other out, my net force is equal to F minus n. So n is equal to F minus net force. So the contact force between the two blocks is equal to F minus MA, but we know F is 12 newtons, and we know MA would be 2 kilograms times 1.5 meters per second squared, which gives us 3 newtons. And so we would find a crushing force of 9 newtons. The egg would be compressed by a 9 newton force. Now let's double check and see if this is correct. What if we made a free body diagram for the 6 kilogram block? OK. Normal force from the ground and mg cancel out. And what force is external to the 6 kilograms for case A. Well, the 12 newton force is not applied directly to the 6 kilogram block. The only external force applied directly to it is the contact between the two, the crushing force. So there's a force this way, N, 
which we now know is equal to 9 newtons, which is a 6 kilogram object, but the normal force from the ground and mg have canceled each other out. So here we have the net force acting on the 6 kilogram block is equal to the mass of the 6 kilogram block um, times the acceleration of the 6 kilogram block. In other words, the acceleration is equal to the net force divided by the mass. Here the net force is 9 newtons, the mass is 6 kilograms, and doesn't that come out to 1.5 meters per second squared, just as it should? So everything seems to check out. So the end result, in case A, the contact force, the crushing force, is 9 newtons. Okay, let's see what happens when we change and reverse the uh, two blocks. So now the 12 newtons force isn't applied directly to the 2 kilogram block, it's now applied directly to the 6 kilogram block and transmitted by this contact force to the 2 kilogram block. We'll repeat the whole process. Let's make a free body diagram for the system. Normal force and mg cancel out, and the only force external to the system is the 12 newtons F pointing to the right. So we're just going to find the same result. The acceleration is the net force on the system divided by the mass of the whole system. So it's 12 newtons divided by 8 kilograms. So no difference between case A and B. The acceleration is 1.5 meters per second squared either way. The difference is going to be in the amount of crushing force. Let's make a free body diagram for the 6 kilogram block. Okay, now we have two external forces along the x-axis. The 12 newtons of force and the contact between the two blocks is external to the 6 kilogram. So pointing to the right is F, our 12 newtons of force, and pointing back to the left is N, the contact between the two blocks. There's also N subscript G, the contact with the ground, and MG. Those cancel out. So we have a net force that's equal to 12 newtons minus the contact force. By Newton's second law, we replace net force with MA. So MA equals 12 minus the crushing force. Let's see, this is a free body diagram just for 6 kilograms. So this is 6 times, we know the whole system accelerates at 1.5 meters per second squared. So this comes out to 9. So 9 equals 12 minus n. So n equals 12 minus 9, which equals 3 newtons. Right. Now there's a way to double check to see if that work is correct, but I'll leave it up to you. Make a free body diagram just for the 2 kilogram block and convince yourself that if that crushing force is indeed 3 newtons, that the acceleration of the 2 kilogram block still comes out to calculate as 1.5 meters per second squared. Right, so the egg is definitely more likely to break in case A. And if that's what you guessed, then your physics intuition is correct. If you guess that it doesn't make a difference, the force would be the same in both cases, then perhaps you learned something from this example problem. Okay, last problem. Three blocks, 24 kilograms, 2 kilograms, and 4 kilograms, are all connected by string segments and pulled across a level frictionless desk by a constant 90 newton horizontal force. What's the acceleration of the system and what's the tension in each of the string segments? Now, the problem didn't tell us which block comes first. So we just know there's three of them. They're connected by individual string segments and the one string that's external to all the blocks is being pulled with a force of 90 newtons. We don't know if it's 24 kilograms, 2 kilograms, 4 kilograms, or possibly this could be 2 kilograms, 4 kilograms, 24. I guess there's a lot of different combinations. So one question I have for you is, does it make a difference when it comes to determining the acceleration of the whole system? 
will the acceleration of the system be dependent on which block is which? So that's the first question we have in this problem, is to find the system's acceleration. And how about this question? Does it matter what the order is in determining the tension? Is the tension in this string going to be the same as the tension? Right? Is the tension in this string and the tension in this string the same, regardless of the blocks? So I'm not going to solve this problem in the rest of this video lecture. I just want to set it up and let you see it. And um, I want you to attempt to determine what the tension is in all the string segments by following a similar approach as we did for the previous two example problems and see if you can identify does the um, order of the masses influence the answers to the question. Okay, thanks for tuning in.